Welcome to our Cornerstone Connection lesson today. On set, we have Kimberly, Silas, Misati, and Chabismak. On instruments, we have Subira and PC, and Joyce will be our sign language interpreter. Before we start, let's start with a word of prayer. Oh God, we come before you this day for thanksgiving and the gift of life. As we're about to start, may you give us the spirit of understanding. In Jesus' name I pray and believe. Amen. So the title of our mission story today is Really Hard Exam. Kashish is only 13 years old, but she is already learning one of the oldest languages in the world. Kashish is learning Sanskrit at a Seventh-day Adventist school in Northern India. Sanskrit is the ancient language of India. No one knows exactly how old it is, but people say they were using it in India at least 1,500 years before Jesus was born. Today, all Indian school children have learned Sanskrit because Hindi and many other languages in India are based on Sanskrit. But Sanskrit is a hard language to learn. The words are difficult to pronounce. The way a word is pronounced depends on if there's a dot below the word, a dot above the word, or a dot at the end of the word. A child has to look at the word very carefully to see where the dot is in order to know how to pronounce the word correctly. Not many people speak Sanskrit. It is usually only spoken by Hindu priests when they recite chants for religious rituals. Kashish comes from a Seventh-day Adventist family. She never had anyone speak Sanskrit except in school. It was hard. But then Kashish fell sick the day before a big exam in Sanskrit. She needed to study for the exam when she came home from school, but her forehead felt really hot. She felt too weak to stand. She didn't feel any better lying in bed. She could only think about the dreaded Sanskrit exam. She decided to pray. Heavenly Father, please heal me soon, she prayed. Please help me tomorrow to pass the exam and get a good grade tomorrow. Amen. As soon as she finished the prayer, she felt better. She opened her textbook and studied for the exam as best as she could. She also reviewed notes that she had taken in class. She wasn't able to study much, just a few things here and there. The next morning, Kashish felt strong enough to go to school, but she felt nervous. She knew that she wasn't ready for the exam. Before leaving the house, she prayed to God for help. At school, the teacher gave Kashish a piece of paper with a list of questions written in Sanskrit. Kashish looked at the questions. She looked carefully to see if there was a dot below the word, a dot above the word, or a dot at the end of the word. She blinked. She looked again. She couldn't believe her eyes. The questions on the exam paper were exactly what she had studied the previous day. She knew all the answers. God had heard her prayer. Kashish was so happy. An hour later, Kashish finished the exam and handed it in. Two days later, she got the results. The teacher had given her 13.5 points out of 15 points. It was a very good grade. Kashish smiled. After that experience, Kashish wants to encourage other boys and girls to pray. I would like to say that there is power in prayer, she said. Once I had an exam in Sanskrit. It's a really hard language and I wasn't ready. I didn't prepare well, but I prayed and God gave me a good grade on the exam. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help construct a new school building for Kashish and other students in Ani. India. The 450 students at Kashish School now study in an old building that was built by a German missionary in 1976. Thank you for helping to give Kashish and her classmates a new school building.
Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Happy Sabbath. Oh, it's a joy to have you here together with us. As we begin a new lesson entitled, Who's Counting? Nani ane sabu. But before we start, <laughs> before we start, I'd just like to introduce some of our panelists over here. Uh, and we'll start here from my right. Go ahead, Kimberly. Happy Sabbath. My name is Kimberly. I'm happy to be here with you. Well, happy to have you too. Uh, my name is Silas, and I'm happy to have you here. I am Misati, Misati Nyambane. I'm thrilled to be here. Fantastic, fantastic, fantastic. Before we start, Silas, please pray for us. Okay, let's pray. Our Father, who is above in heaven, thank you for this day. As we dive into this lesson, we pray that you may be with us, guide us, give us understanding. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh -huh. Who's counting? Who's counting? That's the title of our, of our lesson. You know, ladies and gentlemen, in this world that's filled with sin and tumult and trouble, we often think that who on earth is faithful to God? You know, who on earth uh, still obeys God? But we have an assurance in today's lesson that indeed there are some people who are still faithful to God. And just as we begin, we want to go right into the interactive part of our lesson and discuss uh, what do you think? What do you think? Kimberly, what do you think? The what do you think section. Are you? Okay, so on to the what do you think section. Uh, this is either or, or, so that should be your answer. Think through the following questions and prepare to defend the side you take. The first question is, since it is so difficult to know a person's heart, do you believe a majority of people will be saved or a minority of people will be saved? So what do you think, panel? Yeah, so personally, I think a minority of people will be saved. Very yeah. few, as in just a really small number compared with the actual. The reason I say that is, first I count the openly, the, as in the openly wicked, those people who just are openly wicked, that is, so there are those straight to the fire of hell. Then there are the plenty hypocritical Christians, plenty of those. Then there are typical people who have decided to make sin their home. And then, you know, then there are those, then there are those Christians or those believers, those religious people who actually live up to their faith and their values. Then there are those people who no one ever thinks they would be saved, but because for them, in their heart of hearts, their values are correct and they live up to their light and their own values, those will be saved. That's yeah. few. Yeah. Few people will be saved. What about you, Silas? Okay, for me, I think that few people will be saved because, not because that God's grace is not sufficient to save everyone, but because some people just know what is right, know what is wrong, but they say that I'm having my t the time of my life doing what is wrong, doing it with ease, but if you actually think about it, it's actually not with ease. It's, it's disturbing. They have guilt. Yeah. yeah. Um, on to the second question. Do you think we will be surprised by who is saved? Since one looks on the, uh, on the outside, but God looks on the heart, or will we not be surprised by who is saved because our lifestyle tends to convey our deepest values. By their fruit, you will know them. Okay, I, I want to incline towards the latter that we will know. But one thing I do know is the former is what I go with. Because, fine, on the latter, we can say by their fruits you shall know them. But a lot of the fruits we look for are the fruits of our opinions, not the fruits that are in the Word of God. Because typically, it's extremely... I look at the Word of God is extremely simple. Because if we just take the Ten Commandments, like, does this, this person has no idols, nice, doesn't cast, doesn't swear, doesn't use the name of God in vain. This person has one God, may not be your God, but he has one God, has no idols, one God. This person keeps a day of worship, like remember the Sabbath day, but for them, based on where they are, they don't know the Sabbath truth. 
So what they do know is you go to worship on this particular day, and that's all they know. They don't kill, they don't steal, they don't commit adultery. They don't lie, and they don't covet their neighbor's property. That's, that's God's sort of checklist. But for us, we're like, hey, no, you must be a Christian. You must look Christianly. So and that's, that's the thing. So I'd go with the former. Mm-hmm. What about you, Silas? What do you think? I think I'll go with the latter because if you think about it, think about, uh, think about the story of Moses where he, he was well off throughout the journey in the wilderness. Then it reached the one point when he was told to speak to the rock and he decided to hit the rock because of anger. And he didn't make it to the promised land. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right, Kimberly, ask us the last one. Oh, before we move to the last question, uh, I'd like to say I agree with what Misati says because in my view, I feel as if we always judge people and we always judge them and say, oh, this one is saved, this one is not. We always have perceptions about people. And yet somebody's relationship with God is personal. So definitely we'll be shocked because we have our perceptions, but then there's the truth about their relationship with God. The third question, do you think it is easier to be faithful, obedient to God in adversity, or is it, or it is easier to be faithful to God when positive things are happening. And this is where I immediately jump in and I say, either. That there is no definitive answer, but I'd say for most people, it's easier to be faithful to God in adversity because a lot of people have normalized suffering and like hard life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not full of, like in unis, people have uh, like normalized queen armor, like just go hungry. You know, that sort of stuff. So because people have normalized, like, being in adversity, often people find it easier to be, like, to be faithful in adversity, like when the whole world is crumbling and things are falling apart, and then you're like, Jesus, please save me. But of course, at that point, you're, you're, you're hanging on to Christ as a last straw, as the thread, that is. But I think that's where the Bible comes in and says, it is difficult for a person who has experienced like the blessing of God to go away then come back to God. Because what would happen is if someone has been used to a very prosperous and lovely and amazing life and they have been faithful to God in that, if they ever deviate, and when you deviate from the laws of God, you will suffer, of course. So when someone moves into that state of adversity and suffering, they're like, why is my God? I think that's actually like the Israelites. The Israelites something small, small problems come in and they're like, hey, sh- let's go back, people, as in for them. But now when God sh- comes through and he's like, he just shows himself powerful, and they're like, yes, this is our God, man. And those are the Israelites. Yeah. Silas? I think that it's easier to serve God in terms of adversity because look at it this way. When you're suffering, you go like, God, if you help me this one time, let me say you've made a mistake. Then your parents, okay, the consequences of the mistake, basically. Then you go like, God, if you free me from these consequences, but this one time I'm sorry for the rest of my life. But you actually, do you actually think about what you see? Because life has consequences. Yes, we accept that, but you still want to go to free from this. So I think it's easier to serve God in times of adversity. Because someone who is well off, they don't really think they need anything more than what they have. Or what they need, they can struggle and get because they know how to. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting question, by the way. You know, I think that it's hard to, I think it's hard to serve God, period. It's hard to serve God, whether it's in adversity or it's in uh, prosperity. <laughs> you, do you remember, for example, you know, in adversity, I think of the martyrs. You know, you can imagine when the persecution is at its height. Eh? You and your adversity, that's a year on buyer. You know, and you're being told, renounce yet, eh? renounce your, your Christianity. Hmm? And if you don't, if you do, then you're saved. If you don't, you know, your head is chopped off. 
And in prosperity, I think about the rich young ruler. You know how hard it is to serve God when you're wealthy and you need nothing? Which I think is what you gentlemen are really saying, you know. When the world is at your, at your feet, you know, do you know how hard it is for you to remain humble and to remember your redeemer and that you are nothing but dust when everybody keeps telling you that you are the greatest thing since sliced bread? Huh? Difficult. It's difficult to serve God. And it's an attitude that we must have. Having said that, we now want to move into the story of a man who found it difficult to serve God, even in prosperity, at the height of his, uh, at the height really of his, uh, of his abilities. Huh? At the height of his abilities. And I want to get this right. Uh, just give me a moment. Mm-hmm. Indeed. Uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Misati Nyambani is going to take us through the out of your story. My good sir, uh, take us through the, into the story. Into the story. So right here we have Elijah. And Elijah asks the people, how long will you waver between two opinions? How long will you waver between two gods? If God is God, serve him. If Baal is God, serve him. And now, the anticlimax here is the guy goes into a cave. After such a powerful moving speech, he's like, guys, I'm now going to hide here a bit. You know, guys? Gone. So now the word of the Lord comes to him and asks him, what are you doing here? Like, what are you doing in this cave? Then he's like, I have been zealous. I have fought very hard. These people are hard-headed. These people don't want to decide. I and I only am left in the whole of Israel. That's why the word of the Lord comes and says, come outside, the Lord shall come. The Lord shall pass by. And what happens is the Lord passes or there is a wind. The wind comes in, blows. But God is not in the wind. An earthquake comes, but God is not in the earthquake. Then a still, small voice comes and asks him again, what are you doing in this cave? And he just goes back and says, he had been zealous where he had fought, all that kind of stuff, and that he was the only one left. And God decides that, you know what? Your solution isn't for me to give you a pep talk. That your solution is, I'm going to give you work to do. So he says, you go and anoint Hazael, king of Aram. Then I want you to go and anoint Jehu, king of Israel. Mm -hmm. And lastly, I want you to anoint Elisha as a prophet to stand in your place after you go after you. I want him to stand in your place. And he says, whoever escapes Hazael, Jehu shall destroy. Whoever escapes Jehu, Elisha shall utterly destroy destroy. Then he continues and drops the bombshell and says, but I have kept for myself 7,000 in Israel. I believe that, that's exact figure. Let me get it here. Mm-hmm. Exactly. 7,000 as a reserve for me who have not bowed the knee to Baal nor have kissed his image. Yeah, that's a very good summary of that story. And I must say very well done. Now, there are various aspects that we see coming out of this story. Huh? Number one, the first aspect that we see is probably Elijah's despair, you know. And as rightly as you've put it, you know, he has just come from a high, you know, he has given the speech of a lifetime, he has slain the prophets of Baal, you know, he has stuck it to the man, you know, and has come out victorious, right? But then he flees, uh, Perhaps maybe just let me ask the panel, why does he flee? What's going through his mind? And this perhaps we, we saw it in last week's lesson, but why does he flee? And, and what's going through his mind? So I think one, hap- one thing that clearly happens is sadly he was scared by a woman mm-hmm. into hiding. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds really misogynistic. Yeah. Yes. But anyway, that's a fact. He was scared by a woman and then he ran for his life away from Jezebel because Jezebel said, you know what? If I get my hands on you, hey, you're and here, you're gone. Uh, no, that's true, that's true. So this guy is scared. You know, he has been zealous for the Lord, but now he has been threatened, and a threat that really, you know, shakes him up. And he's told, "Where we? <laughs> By this time tomorrow morning, you will be just the same as those prophets of Baal." And so he flees. Huh? He runs away and uh, and hides in this cave. You know, hides in this cave. Uh, now, the second phase, 
Alilindil cave, huh? Alilindil cave. Um, how does he feel while he's in the cave? You know, he repeats it almost three times. He says, you know, God comes to him and he says, I've been very zealous for the Lord. You know, how does he feel? Uh, is there some sense of abandonment? Mm. Is there some sense of loneliness in his, in, in his reaction? What do you guys think? How does this guy feel while he's in the cave now? While he's in the cave now, uh, how does he feel? Mm. I feel as if at that moment in time, he's, yes, as you said, he's, he feels abandoned. You know, it's like that time in your life when you're going through a problem and you feel like God is not there at all. So that's how he feels because he feels as if all these people want to kill me. You know, like Jezebel wants to kill me. Like, where are you, God? Like, why aren't you? You're not coming through for me. So he's definitely, he's, he might be disappointed and mm -hmm. he feels abandoned. Yeah, okay. he does feel abandoned. I think that it's not realistic for... Elijah to feel abandoned at this point because, okay, not really realistic about being abandoned, but you remember that uh, when there was no, when he had said that if the fire of God lights, it will rain, yeah? Mm -hmm. And there was no, there were no clouds. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he prayed until there were clouds. So, if if he if he felt abandoned in some way, he could talk to God and God would yeah. give him comfort. Yeah, that's that's a good point that you're bringing about. You know, realistically, uh, in all intents and purposes, he shouldn't feel bad. Yeah, because you know, as in like he he you know he has just come from a victory. You know, he has just come from winning big time. You know, why yeah. it, it's unreasonable for him to feel that. You know, and I think that's why God comes and asks him, uh, what, what on earth are you doing here, Elijah? You know, what on earth are you doing here? But you see, from his perspective, number one, he thinks that he's alone. You know, nobody showed up, and just let me, you know, just try and put the point out there. Nobody showed up uh, when he was killing those prophets of uh, Baal. You know, nobody from the side of the Lord came out. But it is only after he receives that reassurance, eh? that, uh, you know, God has saved 7,000 people. And I think Misati brought that, that number out quite clearly. Yeah? 7,000 people. Kulikwana, there were 7,000 people who were just like him, who still worshipped God, who still worshipped God, you know. And so he does feel somewhat lonely. He does feel somewhat withdrawn. But after God comes and indeed gives him work, you know, and tells him, uh, you know, Elijah, there are more people. Uh, who are worshipping me as well. You're not alone. You know, and he gives him something to do, work to do. Then we see that he, he's able to, he feels encouraged now, which is a different set all together. Uh, um, just another final point. Uh, what similarities do we see between Elijah and ourselves, you know? You know, just looking at Elijah, you know, sometimes we might be just like Elijah. You know, we are working tremendously hard for God, but then we feel as if we're the only ones who are doing this, you know? All our other friends are living their lives, you know, doing what they want, seeing what they think, or, or rather, uh, fulfilling what they think is right. But then we are here worshiping God, and sometimes we feel as if God is not reciprocating. Now, how does that tie into our lives in day to day, and how can we seek to, to, to overcome that uh, from the story of Elijah? I don't okay. know if you understood. Yeah. I think that. You know, sometimes we, it's after an exam, you, you actually so, kind of didn't read, but you passed. You had prayed the night before, thinking that, well, I need to pray, and God will hear me and help me pass this exam. You obviously know you didn't read, and then he, and then you pass. Yeah. And then the following week, let's say you're now on holiday, and then you feel like, where is God at this point? So I think we, we are like Elijah. After we see something, we are not sure about it. And then we start asking ourselves, where is God? Yeah, so I think in such cases, we are like Elijah. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, I, I, I understand somewhat what you've said. Eh? Uh, you know, when we're saying that, you know, we have to have 
that faith in God. And that God actually does come through in those moments and, and seeks us out. Um, I want to move on to uh, the Monday part of our lesson. And this is the key text. The key text. And I just wanted Silas to read for us the key text and tie it into the story. Uh, particularly just looking at Elijah himself and how zealous he was for God uh, in, in fulfilling his mission. Okay, the key text is First Kings 19 verse 14, 15, and 18. Mm -hmm. So it says, Elijah replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me. The Lord said to him, I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and those whose mouths have not kissed him. Yeah, well, you know, from the key text, again, it's just that, that reassurance that God is giving Elijah, you know? And he's telling Elijah that, you know, you're not alone. You're not alone. And even us sometimes when we might feel lonely, when we might feel as if we are the only ones who are actually worshipping God, God knows that there are some people who are worshipping him that we might not have an idea about, you know? And it really points us back to the title of our lesson, Who is counting. Who is counting? And indeed, God, God is counting. God is counting. All right. Uh, Kimberly, now, uh, perhaps maybe you can just read for us the flashlight once again and just relate it, relate it to the key text and even to our title. Okay, so the flashlight. Mm -hmm. Among Earth's inhabitants scattered in every land, there are those who have not bowed to, how, who have not bowed the knee to bow. Like the stars of heaven, which appear only at night, these faithful ones will shine forth when darkness covers the earth and gross darkness the people. Then let no man attempt to number Israel today, but let everyone have a heart of flesh, a heart of tender sym sympathy, a heart that, like the heart of Christ, reaches out for the salvation of a lost world. So, okay, to relate this to the key text, I think it's just talking about the way you may think that maybe you're the only one who's worshipping God, following Jesus, and, you know, doing everything right, but you're not alone. And we might not be many, but we are, we are quite a number that are still in the faith and still working towards the goal of heaven. Amen, amen. You know, I know I, I really empathize with teens today and youth today. You know, whenever you, even me, whenever I log on to Instagram, whenever I am on TikTok, whenever I'm on YouTube, you know, and you just look at <laughs> really the world today, you know, and it's filled with debauchery, you know, and lewdness, you know. But uh, it is comforting to know that God still has his people and that we are not alone in this world. All right, very good. Um, now, having said that, there are some verses that can encourage you uh, in times of loneliness, in times when you feel that you're all alone. And uh, in the lesson today, they are found in the punchlines, in the punchlines. Uh, Misati, why don't you take us through some of the punchlines, uh, read your, tell us which one is your favorite, and then maybe you can uh, ask us to read some as well. Interesting, yeah. So, the punchline that stood out for me, is Psalm 12, 1, help Lord for no one is faithful anymore. Those who are loyal have vanished from the human race. Now, I'm not sure if this was David who wrote this, but a psalmist wrote it and I think for him, it was that he was at the point where he was feeling like, I think he was feeling like Elijah mm -hmm. at, at that point mm -hmm. and I think it's at that point where God slides in God slides into the DM and he's like uh -huh. <laughs> my guy my girl, like <laughs> relax. It's like, you know, it's like, relax. Yeah. I got you. I got you. You know? Yeah. I, got you. I mean, yeah. So I think, yeah, that's, yeah, that stands out for me. So, yeah. as in, so guys, what stands out for you? Yeah, that's yeah. a great, that, that's a great one. Um, uh, maybe you can assign us to read some of those punchlines. Uh, sure. I think you can pick your, pick your favorite, whatever has stood out for All you. All right. All right. No, that's a good one. That's a yeah. good one. Why don't you pick your favorite, uh, Kimberly? Okay. Um, I'll read first Peter 1 verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with 
an inexpressible and glorious joy. Amen. Amen. That's a lovely verse. You know who's on our side? You know, when, you know, sometimes you might think, uh, who's got your back? You know, uh, the world, you know, the world have everybody, you know, you say, oh, this is what who and so and so does. Oh, this is what so and so does. But you know who's on our side? God is on our side. You know, who, do you know who God is? He rules the universe. Can you imagine the king of the universe is on your side? And this verse uh, 1 Peter 1 verse 18, it says, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. When you remember, when you remember who in whom you have believed, then, you know, your joy is, is, is un- unmatched, really. Uh, Mr. Silas, pick your favorite and read it out. Okay. My favorite is... Revelation 14, verse 12, it says, mm. Here is a call for the endurance of saints, those who keep his commandments of God and hold fast the faith of Jesus. It Amen. says, this verse technically says that, he, that God is going to reward you who keep his commandments faithfully. And you know, sometimes we think that if God rules the whole universe, there are so many planets. Yeah, there are so many people in this world. Why would he remember me only and, and forget about someone who... But God is, has the ability to remember each one of us and reward us the way... Amen, he, amen, amen. That's a wonderful verse. It's a wonderful verse. Um, and it's saying, here is the call of endurance of the saints. Those who keep the commandments of God and hold fast to the faith of Jesus Christ. This is a description of the saints here on earth, underneath the sun. Yeah? That they are those who keep the commandments of God and hold fast to the faith. And that's wonderful. My favorite verse by far is John 10, 14 to 16. And it says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for my sheep. I have other sheep that are not in this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice. And, I, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. And this is Jesus assuring us that anatujua, natunajuana, natukopamoja. God really knows us. He really knows who we are. And we are not alone. And there are people who we will not even... Uh, as, as Misati said at the start, who you might not even realize, you know, are part of that sheepfold, but we are together. You know, one thing, just let me say, uh, that I love about the Seventh-day Adventist Church is that this church is present within 256 countries worldwide. Present within 256 countries worldwide. We have people all over the world who believe uh, who believe in the creation of this world in one creator and in salvation through Jesus Christ. Amen? That is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful promise that we have, that God will come one day and take all of us to heaven. Right? And so there is no need to fear. There is no need to be discouraged. Uh, there are other people who keep the faith, even if the faith is not kept perhaps in your neighborhood, even if the faith is not kept in your estate, even if the faith is not kept in your, in your block, you know, you're struggling with the Sabbath. On Sabbath day, Sabbath morning, that's when Club Kiboko is there. That is when uh, that's everybody... When uh, you know, everyone um, is watching the match. Everyone is watching the match. At 4.30. Friday, uh, Friday evening at 4.30, you know, and you are an outcast because you're not able to join in. I remember when I was growing up, um, every Sabbath morning, that was when football, you know, that was when all tournaments were there. And if you did not play, you were almost an outcast. You were almost an outcast. But then we can take heart in that there are other people who believe what we believe and who are not afraid to stand up for God. Uh, as we close, I just would like to ask Kimberly to read for us the Father Insight. Um, the Father Insight, Kimberly. Um, and it says, Patience and our trials will keep us from seeing and doing those things which will injure our own souls and injure those with whom we associate. Let your trials be what they will. 
nothing can seriously injure you if you exercise patience. If you are calm and unexcited when in trying positions. Yes, indeed, that's wonderful advice. Uh, advising us to be patient under trials. So ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our lesson. And uh, perhaps just before we close, uh, I'll just give maybe one or two minutes to each of our panelists just to give their closing parting shot. You know, really what they took from the lesson and what they think that you can gain from the lesson as well. We'll start from my extreme right here. Kimberly, go right ahead. Um, so my parting shot is from what we've learned today, we can, we should know that in everything, God is with us. Like Elijah was experiencing this challenge, but God came through for him. And when he cried out to him, God answered him. He gave him an answer. And so in our lives, God will come through for you. Just keep on asking God, keep on being faithful, and keep on trusting in him. Amen. God will come through for you. Silas? I just want to say that when we feel that God has abandoned us, we should think about the promises he has kept for us and his promises that he's fulfilled to us and claimed them. Amen. Think about the promises that God has made to us. And as it strikes me is that there are always people with whom, though you may not be able to see it, mm -hmm. like at the moment, or mm -hmm. some of that sort, but as long as you let go mm -hmm. of that which you have to get something that's much better, mm -hmm. you know, as in what, what comforts me is uh, just the law of the universe, that mm -hmm. nature cannot permit an existence of a vacuum. Mm -hmm. So if there is space, the space must be filled with something, mm -hmm. that is. And because of that very reason, mm -hmm. if there is space for people with whom you would relate with, and you're not in any way trying to numb or medicate the pain, I think God, as in somehow, like by magic, <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. whatever, but somehow you'd end up finding something yeah. that perfectly meets your desires, yeah. provided you keep an open space for it. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. God is there for us, and he will always meet us at our point of need. Huh? Even if that need is to understand and to know that there are people who worship him, right? People who are true to him, and to encourage us to say that, you know, we too, we too can stand firmly for God. May God bless you wherever you are, God keep you, and until the next lesson, we ask that you may be well. Now, before we close, perhaps, uh, Ms. Ati, you can say a prayer for us uh, as we close. Uh, let's pray. Thank you, God, for your goodness, because you know that you are a loving Father, you are a miracle worker, and you desire to be with us in every single moment, experience, and element of our life. We desire that we may walk with you, and that we may see you, and that we may see you through others. In Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. 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 And goodbye.